think we'll be able to kind of communicate better and you'll be able to see better if some of the folks move up. Um, I'm going to do this talk about something called Clean Local Energy Accessible Now, and that's an acronym that refers to a way of making renewable energy possible. Uh, it, it is known by different terms throughout the world, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But I wanted to start by kind of getting a little sense of who I'm talking to here. How, how many of us are from Buffalo, from the Buffalo Occupy? And how many from downstate? The Wall Street. They, 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 uh, Bill, just so you know, they all had to go, they just left a few minutes ago to, to kind of coordinate with the people they're staying with tonight. That's fine. Just so you yeah. know. Okay. All right. So what I want to, what I want to know is how many here, and, and be honest, I think different people have different opinions about this, think that climate change is a serious problem. Anybody think that it probably isn't? Okay. All right. I, well. Good to know, good to know. I have a whole other presentation that talks about what's likely to happen, particularly in western New York. But given that it's, it's just a couple folks, I'd love to have that conversation with you at some time, but I'm going to focus on assuming that most people think it's a serious problem at this point. How many people think that a lack of good jobs is a serious problem at this point? Anybody that doesn't? Okay. Flowing off of that, how many think we need to do something about climate change? There are people, you know, in the world that thinks it's not something that humans are causing or that we can do anything about. Okay. I assume from the hands that are going up, we also generally think that we're not moving fast enough to do anything about this. How many people there is think there is a way to succeed to, to turn this around? Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of with the, the those. It's, it's a really difficult way forward. There, there are ways to make it happen, but it's pretty complex, as we're going to see. Okay, so in terms of climate change, this is something that shows us where the carbon emissions are coming from in terms of the energy that we're using. And you can see, running across the bottom, that kind of coal and petroleum, coal is the green, petroleum is the black, we're kind of about the, generating about the same amount for a while and then no black I'm sorry is the total so for a long time coal was uh, much more of a problem and then as we got into the automobile age petroleum also became a major part of the problem but at this time at this point it's petroleum and coal that kind of are the main major em emission sources and natural gas is kind of coming up as well in that this shows the number of coal plants that are planned for the United States, or were as of a couple years ago. If this many coal plants were built, we would be completely screwed. Uh, I should introduce myself a little bit, and I'm wondering why this thing is moving on its own. But uh, I'm, I'm working with the Sierra Club Energy Committee, uh, and also with a, a company called Buffalo Geothermal. The Sierra Club has done a lot of work on stopping coal plants. It has a Beyond Coal um, uh, initiative at this point, and they have been successful in stopping many of these, but there are plans for most of them to still go forward. This shows, and this is from ExxonMobil. This is their vision, and it's not so much what they want, it's what they actually think is going to be happening. You can see down at the bottom there's a continuum of years, and going from 2000 to 2030, they're thinking that by 2030 we're still going to be really plugged in to, I'm not seeing the colors very well at this point, into gas and into coal and into oil. Um, that's what they think is still going to be happening. There's a little yellow section up there that talks about renewables. That's what they think is, is probably going to happen. This, on the other hand, is something from the Union of Concerned Scientists, and it basically shows that we have the chance to turn this thing around, and that with energy efficiency, we can be cutting back on a lot of the energy that we're using, and also we can increase the amount of renewables. The black at the bottom is coal. We can really decrease coal, and that there is a, a, a path forward in, in relation to energy that can work to reduce the amount of carbon we're putting into the atmosphere. Now this is a key point. The emissions of the future rich must equal the emissions of today's poor, not the other way around. 
you know, a lot of people are thinking at this point, China's economy is coming up, India's economy is coming up, these folks are going to be getting more and more wealthy, they're going to be acting more like us, and they're going to be generating a lot more pollution and a lot more carbon emissions. And what Sokolow is saying is we need to change the way we generate energy, we need to change the amount of energy we need to live and to feel like we're, we're prospering and we're living well in the world and that that needs to happen, that essentially the folks that are doing well are going to use the same amount of energy as people today use who are poor because it, we're going to be that much more efficient and we're going to have some clean energy uh, that's contributing to that. There's two people that I've followed that have really kind of mapped out the future and what could actually happen in a positive way. There's a lot of people that are thinking about it, but two people that have come up with a lot of data. One is this guy, Robert Sokolow. He's a Prince, uh, Princeton University professor. And the other is uh, Michael Jacobson. What department? The, I'm sorry? What department, Princeton? Oh, I don't know. All right. Sorry. Uh, but this, essentially what Sokolow says, that if we're going to turn this around, it can't be just one thing that happens. It can't be just, you know, everybody starts driving more efficient cars or nobody has cars. You know, if that happened, that would be one of the wedges. He's projecting about seven or eight wedges that need to happen to level off our energy use and our destruction of the environment and the climate. And they each need to start small and grow in the form of a wedge. <coughs> And so when people say to you, oh, all we need is solar on our rooftops, that's not the case. We need solar on our rooftops, plus we need wind, plus we need energy efficiency, plus we need to stop driving so damn much. It needs to be a complete picture, and it's going to be hell to get there, given the way our society is functioning at this point. We are going to need to make some major changes. Here, here you see what Sokolow was, is projecting, energy efficiency, you know, takes a big block off the top, you got passenger vehicle efficiency, um, and then you've got renewables, which is the green. He's even talking about carbon capture and storage, which is something that a lot of us think is kind of foolish at this point. It involves coal technology to a large degree. I'm sorry. Um, the reason why he's pushing because it's a timing, yeah. a timing setting of a slideshow. Okay. So, yeah, I, I, I could take some time to do that, but I think I'd rather just go. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so this shows kind of the, the energy balance that happens in, on our planet. The big box is solar radiation. We get so much solar energy, which is what drives wind energy, what's, what drives solar PV, solar thermal, um, and the gas, oil, and coal over here is what we have forever, whereas the big box is solar in one year, and then the little box in the corner is the amount of energy we use on an annual basis. The problem is solar energy is really diffuse. You know, you, you go with coal or you go with gas or you go with oil. This is plant matter that's been underground under really high pressure, really high temperature, a lot of energy being fed into that so that it concentrates the energy incredibly. With, with solar and with wind, you know, we're kind of making it up out of thin air at this point. And it's, it's, it's really difficult to get as much production out of those forms of energy but there is plenty of it to make it happen. This, this shows, I was talking about the kind of change that we're gonna to need to go through. This is Michael Jacobson out of Stanford University. He's saying to, to power the world by 2050 completely with renewable energy, it would take, you know, the, you know the, the wind turbines out of Bethlehem Steel? Those are two megawatt turbines, they're very big. He's talking about five megawatt turbines, so that much bigger. It would take 3.8 million of those around the planet, in addition to um, 1.7 billion rooftop solar systems, as well as you know all kinds of tidal turbines and, and elsewhere. There is a way to do it, but it would be massive. And if people can uh, want to tell you that it's not going to happen in their backyard, that's not the case. It has to happen everywhere if we're going to make the transition. Okay, so there are several ways to make renewables actually happen. We could have a carbon tax. We can do what I call green scissors. And then there's other ways that are currently being used. I'm going to talk about the first two first because those are things that would need to happen on a federal level and there's not some, they're not something that we're dealing with on a policy level at this point. A carbon tax. This once again is ExxonMobil. And they're saying 
that if there was a tax on carbon that, I should get my glasses on to be able to see all this, essentially the price of coal would go up so much, it's the one on the far left, it would go up so much that it would be about equivalent to coal with carbon, carbon uh, capture. And the price of gas as well, because gas emits a lot of carbon as well, would go up over what nuclear is and wind would be the least expensive because a carbon tax would not really impact wind. So essentially if, if, a, if the, the United States had a just policy where there was a tax on carbon, that would, that would really help and it would make a difference and it would incentivize things right. Not likely to happen very soon, but let's all push for it whenever we get a chance. Um, the other thing is the green scissors idea, which essentially is taking, you know, take a pair of scissors and go through the budget, cut out everything that's a subsidy of fossil fuels. We've been subsidizing the crap out of fossil fuels since forever. You know, this is a mature technology. There's no reason to be doing that anymore. This doesn't even include the military expenditures that we have, you know, to defend the interests that, that get the, the oil and gas out of other people's countries here. So there's enormous subsidies going into fossil fuels, and if people tell you, oh, I don't like renewables because they're, they're subsidized, you know, this stuff has been subsidized, there's no reason going forward for it to be subsidized, and it's subsidized on a massive level. And those are the people essentially that are owning the government at this point, the people that are getting these subsidies. So it didn't cost the bus going into wars and all this garbage. That's right. That's right. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about in the context of the other, the other methods of sub subsidizing or incentivize renewables, I'm going to do it around this concept of clean local energy accessible now. And this is a, the kind of format I'm going to use as kind of a summary of what's going on, an introduction to what clean is, uh, why they work, and some kind of typical alternatives that people put forward to say we can't do it, and then a conclusion. So, Essentially, what it is, is it's an, an industrial policy. Kind of the first country that did this on a mass basis was Germany. And they said, listen, we are going to lead the world in producing this stuff. You know, we're going we're gonna to make some sacrifices. We're going to pay more for our electricity, but we're going to do it in a way that creates jobs. And that's not something that's really happened in the United States. For all we've talked about green jobs, the, the uh, incentives have kind of been kind of halfway measures and not long-term measures. In order to create jobs, particularly if you're going to do manufacturing, you need to have something that's going to be in place for a while and that's going to produce a demand that's big enough to, to work so that people can build a factory, invest in the factory, make the stuff, and have it move forward. Um, this, this method is the best at accelerating renewable projects and getting the most of clean energy at any, at any one time. It's in 80 jurisdictions around the world right now, jurisdiction being a country, a state, or a province. As I said, it provides a stable investment climate. What you're saying essentially is, we're gonna pay what this stuff is worth and what it costs to make it happen. And that means that banks, other institutions will put their money to, to regular people to put this kind of stuff up. They'll, they'll help you, you know, in Germany and in fact in Ontario now, the German banks, because they're familiar with this, they're funding the Ontario rooftop programs that are going on. In New York State right now, I'm gonna talk more about this later, but essentially we are in a relatively good position to, to states in the United States, as sorry as that sounds. Um, but we could do much better. There are political roadblocks at this point. The, the folks in the New York State Senate and Assembly are not considering a clean program, but the Sierra Club has a, a process going forward that's gonna push them to do that. And I'm gonna move ahead at this point. So this is some of the main forms we're looking at in terms of renewable energy. These folks up here are at the Bethlehem Steel Place, uh, the, the Steel Winds Project after it was first built. These are a bunch of local community folks. Uh, someone doing solar, small-scale hydro, and biomass. Okay, uh, uh, the terminology, Chris. Can you explain biomass? Quickly. Yeah. Uh, well, there's different forms of biomass. I mean, some of it you can use to, to you use wood and you burn wood and you burn plant materials. Um, and, and you would do that to create electricity. You could also turn it into um, fuel. There's, there's a number of different forms of biomass. <coughs> 
So essentially around the world, there's a couple different ways this is called. Mainly it's called a feed-in tariff. And I don't like using that term because the word tariff in our, in our language, in our context, means a tax on imports. This would not be a tax. There would, it wouldn't involve government funding. It wouldn't involve state budgets. Uh, it would be something that would be kind of in the rate base of the utility companies, but it's not a tax. And so I think clean is more descriptive, but feed-in tariff or fit is more common throughout the world. Okay, so here, here it is. Prices for energy generated from renewables are set to reflect the cost of doing that plus a modest profit, a socially determined profit. So what that does, it takes all the uncertainty out of it. At this point, if you want to put up a wind turbine or solar, you have to go through all different kinds of conniptions to, to make it happen. But with this, you know essentially what the solar resource is going to be in a place. You know what the wind resource is. So if you have the price set for 15 or 20 years going forward, you know what your income is going to be when you build a solar or a wind or whatever kind of system. And that makes it much more attractive so that everybody can get a part of the ownership picture. This is a key part of why clean programs work. It's not just the big multinational corporations that can do it the way it's incentivized here. But it's, you know, it's Aboriginal tribes in Ontario, it's, uh, you know, homeowners, it's churches, it's community organizations that can do this. So the utilities are required to enter into a standard offering contract. So there's standard language. It's not like you have to go and it's, you know, oh, this is new to us. You know, we're, we're going to make you do this a certain way. Everybody gets the same deal. And the renewables are fed into the grid. This is a key point. At this point, there's an auction. And all the, all the different power sources bid in to get in as part of it. Under a feed-in tariff, the renewables get in automatically. They just feed right in. And the contracts for this are long-term. They're like 15 or 20 years. They also work, and they, they base the prices on the different technologies. If it costs more to do small solar, you get paid more for small solar. If it costs less to do large wind, you get paid less for large wind. Here's an example. Vermont has done this. These are Vermont's prices for their first year. So if you have a solar PV system and you put it up, you're going to get 24 cents for every kilowatt hour generated by that system. If, you have, if you're doing a landfill gas thing, you get 8 cents. If you're doing large wind, you get less than you do if you're doing small wind. I, I should say at this point, that in the United States, Vermont is doing this. The city of Gainesville, Florida is doing this. We had it introduced in the New York State Legislature a couple years ago. They didn't do anything with it. Iowa is considering at this point. California is looking at it as well. There's different levels that different folks are, are doing it. But essentially, what it is, it's kind of the maximized development of renewable energy, creating renewable energy jobs, and doing it at the lowest overall cost. And that is maybe a little counterintuitive, but I will explain more about the cost as we go on. How's my time, Aaron? We're about good. We're pretty good. What time? About 4.30 okay. now. Okay, okay. So at this point, feed-in tariffs or clean programs are responsible for about 50% of the wind that's been put up worldwide, about 75% solar, and 95% of the farm biogas. The best examples, as I think I've been saying, is Germany and Ontario. German, or Ontario has had this for a while, and they just really upped the ante. They, they have a good movement up there that's been pushing on the government. The government is not as crazy as the government is down here most of the time. They have 20,000 jobs created since 2009 and $20 billion of investments. In Germany, you know, you keep on hearing about how bad the economy is in Germany. At this point, in, in Europe. But Germany is kind of like a, a shining light relative to what's going on in Germany, and a lot of, or in Europe. And a lot of that has to do with what they've done with renewable energy. And they've set up where they actually have an export market at this point for the kind of solar and, and wind products they create. And here, here it shows kind of the way the ownership plays out. In Germany, 40% of the renewables are owned by individuals. In the United States, it's like a tiny sliver. You know, farmers own 11%. I'm told that one of every seven farmers in Ontario at this point is invested in renewable energy after a few years of this program. 
And then here is, it just shows kind of the number of feed-in tariffs, that's the upper line, that have been going on online uh, every year. The red line is uh, quotas, which is what we have in New York State. We have something called the Renewable Portfolio Standard. Okay, so performance measures. How do you know if you're succeeding with the policy? One is you're actually bringing renewables on and it's happening quickly. Two is you're creating jobs because you're creating demand for the renewable energy and the equipment it takes. And three is you're succeeding at attracting investment. In terms of wind, wind power capacity, and this is power per number of people. It's megawatts per million people. Spain, Portugal, and Germany are the world leaders. They all have feed-in tariffs. All the countries, um, in Canada they have it only in Ontario, in the U.S. it's only in a few states, but all the other world leaders have recently turned on to feed-in tariffs and now have a policy for that. In terms of solar, Germany now has five point, almost six times the solar PV capacity. They only have 28% of our population. They've only got 4% of our land mass. This, <laughs> yeah, really. This is a, a, a map of solar energy. Germany's solar that comes down onto their land is about equivalent to what Alaska gets. Spain is above Germany on this map. Germany's over in the bottom right. Spain has the equivalent of much of the United States. But essentially anywhere in the continental United States with the exception of Washington State has much better solar than Germany does. Yet Germany has six times what our country all put together has at this point. Here, here you see that the, the numbers are, they have 17,000 megawatts, the United States has 3,000 megawatts. Italy last year did 2,300 megawatts just in one year. The policy that's being pursued in the New York State Legislature would get us 5,000 megawatts by 2026. I mean, that's kind of the comparison of what's going on at this point. So in Ontario, just to, just to show where, where the kind of ownership and the scale is, yes, there are a lot of large-scale projects which we absolutely need, but there's also a lot of community ownership, a lot of Aboriginal ownership, and the microfits are kind of the small solar things that folks would have on their homes. They already have almost 8,000 contracts for that. In terms of jobs created, this slide shows you the relative number of jobs created per gigawatt hours produced of power. And with solar, one of the things about solar is you know, it, it really is, at this point, a, a relatively weak technology because it takes a lot of solar being put up to gain relatively little energy. Um, but it does create the highest number of jobs per gigawatt hour produced. This shows a typical wind turbine company. The, the 250 people that they would need to run it to produce wind turbines and the kind of salary levels. So it's good jobs that, that could be getting produced for this. Are Just so union jobs? I'm sorry? Are these union jobs? Well, this is, this is a typical thing. It depends on the company, whether the company is union or not. So it's an average. Yeah. You know, in, in Western New York, there is a company called Gamesa, which came here to our development agency and said, well, what about here? You know, you're building these turbines out on the waterfront. Looks like, like you got a pretty good climate. The Buffalo Niagara Enter Enterprise said, well, we don't really know much about doing this, so nah, forget it. Gamesa went to Pennsylvania. They have their U.S. headquarters in Pennsylvania. We could be doing much better. Bill, who said no to them? Was, was, it, I, was it the ECID day? No, no, no. sorry, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, Albert. It was, it was the Buffalo Niagara Enterprise or Buffalo Niagara Partnership, right. some part of that, which probably has a big role on the, on the ECID. The Buffalo Niagara Enterprise does the, the scouting for out-of-state companies for ECIDA. Right. So if it doesn't go through Buffalo Niagara, it never makes it to ECIDA. Huh. In other words, what's the name of the Bowtie? Well, actually, that's the sister agency or brother agency. Yeah. Um, so this is something that's out, up on the uh, province of Ontario website. It's all the different new factories that they have. And you can, you know, if it's live, you can click on this and see how many jobs and what they're doing in each of those spots. This shows the jobs that were created in Germany, and they, they're up to a total of almost a third of a million jobs in renewable energy at this point. Remember, with a quarter of the U.S.'s population. You're us with these statistics. I know, diet, Bill. Okay. <laughs> no, it's a good thing. It's just that we can't believe it. Well, is it, Albert, is it not understandable there's too many of them? No, it's, 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 it's very too sad. Too tragically it's understandable. Yeah. It's inspiring. I'm curious how long <laughs> it is. It's not very long.
Right. And right. It really hasn't taken that long. Right. Once the mission is there, yep. it can happen rather quickly. Yeah, they ramped right? up in 2009, and they're talking 20,000 jobs since 2009. Okay, here is, at this point, the way jobs have gone in Germany, you know, in terms of where the jobs are generating energy, renewable energy has shot way up and these other forms are just kind of dying out at this point in Germany. Germany is using this feed-in tariff to get rid of their nuclear power at this point. They, they had the luxury, after Fukushima happened, to say, Forget it, we don't want nuclear power anymore, and we have the capacity to actually make that transition. Bill, quick question. Yeah. Will you, before this is over, will you, uh, are, as part of your discussion, uh, uh, include some suggestions on how we can organize to move this kind of legislation through? Yeah, yeah. Well, let me, let me get to that now and yeah. tell me if this is adequate. I mean, the Sierra Club has been working on this. As I said, New York State had this as a poss possible legislation. We are working at this point. There is statewide legislation to improve the solar picture. We don't think that's adequate, but we want to push a feed-in program and to say that, yes, pass this solar piece, but we need more, okay? We will be meeting Monday evening, and I don't know if that conflicts with what's going on with, with here, but in the Tri-Main building, um, and folks are all invited to be involved with that, I'll, I'll leave my phone number, uh, my contact information. I'll send it out to the group. Okay. And I'm going to give out some cards right now if people are interested in connecting up. Okay, so, um, yes, Ontario, $20 billion in investments. A $7 billion from a South Korea company that's, that's coming in. Okay, so for New York State, believe it or not, New York State is the most efficient state in the con continental U.S. per capita. And a lot of that has to do with New York City and the fact that they have mass transit and the fact that they are fitting a lot of people into buildings that go up and the heat kind of goes up from each level. Um, but, and essentially there are good things going on in this state. There is actually an official recognition of the effects of climate change. We do have a plan of reducing by 45% the amount of energy we use by 2015. And 15% of that is supposed to be efficiency 30% of that is through renewables. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. We have the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which we are part of, which is good. We also have held the line better than any other state on fracking. You know, that's, who knows where that's going, but at, at least we've held the line to this point. And we do have the Green Jobs Group, Green New York program, which you're going to be hearing a lot more of through Operation Push, which we kind of won the local contract for that. But that's going to make it a lot easier to do energy efficiency stuff. We have great potential. This is something that was done by the Blue Green Alliance. Looking at the companies that are already in New York State, if there was a good level of investment in wind power, we could create 18 and a half thousand dollars or thousand jobs uh, in wind. In what time frame? I'm not sure what that piece said. I'd be happy to send it to you, Aaron, but um, probably over the next. I, I don't know. I don't know. But here's a number of companies locally that could be gearing up for that and involved in it. Here is the solar numbers. We could be doing 14,000 jobs in solar just with the manufacturers we already have. Okay, so New York State at this point has an RPS. Essentially they've said they started out at 25%. We, got, we want to get 25% of our power from renewable sources by 2015. What percent do you think we were at at that point given the fact that we have Niagara Falls and all the hydropower? What's that? 3%. We were at 19 already when they set the goal of 25%. So essentially, what they're saying, we're going to change 5.7% of our mix over eight years. It would take us 113 years to get it 100% renewables at this rate. Totally unsatisfactory. They did raise it to 30%, so now the goal is 30%. However, this is after about five or six years into a nine or 10 year program, we are at about 40% of where we need to be to get to that 30%. So it's, it's not cutting it. In addition to, be, to running short already, we're kind of running out of steam in our renewable program. The, the main renewables we've had has been wind. And as you can see, there was a lot of wind coming up in 07 and 08. And then 09, not so much. 10, nothing. 2011, one wind farm went up. This is it in graphic form. 
Essentially, we were doing all right getting some wind up, and, and now it's cutting back. This shows New York State where we stand among the top 20 states. At the end of 2010, we're in about 15th place uh, for wind development, but in, in terms of what actually happened in 2010, we're rapidly slipping at this point. This shows what is in our uh, grid, the New York ISO, the Independent System Operator. The, the green bar is projects that are in the queue to happen, and the blue bar is what happened in 2010. So we're really getting creamed by even most of the rest of the United States, which is not really doing that well internationally. Okay. Um, so kind of in summary, and, and you know, I said 19% of it was already hydro, and we're going for 30%. This includes transportation, and all the energy we use, heating our homes and so on and so forth, only 13% of that comes from in-state. So we're sending a lot of money outside of New York State, largely to coal companies, oil companies, and gas companies. Um, and when you think about it, yes, it would cost money to pay the full freight for renewables, but NYSERDA already has $3 billion set up to make that happen and has committed $3 billion of ratepayers' money, and those are the results we're getting. We're at 40% of where we need to be. And that is not enough where they've targeted. Okay, so why do clean programs work? TLC, transparency, longevity, and certainty. Essentially what you're saying is, for 15 years, you're gonna get the right price for generating this energy. Anybody would invest in a project like that. It is not hard to get financing, it's not hard for it to get it to happen for community organizations, anybody that has access to decent credit. So it's, it's cost effective because of the financing. There's also something that is really gonna hurt your head when I explain it to you, but it's called the merit order effect, and it's pretty important. I want you to at least hear about it. And it, it also in, increases local ownership, and that helps it work as well. I'm not gonna spend time on that one. This shows what has happened in the United States as a whole. We generally fund renewables through something called the production tax credit. It's something that gets wound up in congressional horse trading. And every now and then it, it lapses. And when it lapses, production goes way down. You're thinking about investing in a plant to manufacture wind turbine blades or, wind, or you know any wind turbine parts. And you look at this and you say, I can't handle this. And that's why we don't have the kind of investment we need in this country in renewables. This shows the impact of different policies on the cost. The blue bar up there is the amount of solar that has been installed, and the yellow bar is the cost. So in Germany, they've installed a lot, and it costs a hell of a lot less. It costs like $4 a watt when this was put into place versus over $6 a watt in the US. OK, here's something that I apologize if it hurts your head. I, it, it took me like 25 times thinking about this before it sunk in, but it's really important because renewable energy can lower the price of what you're paying for energy, even though it's an expensive technology at this point. And it's called the merit order effect. It's also called the price suppression effect. You know, the official bodies in New York State looked at this when they did the RPS. They realized it's a factor and they actually um, counted it in. But essentially, the way energy is priced in New York State is a uniform uh, clearing price. So if, it, if what we're dealing with is, uh, let me get this up. If we're dealing with a situation where wind, wind has very low marginal costs. The main thing that happens with wind or solar is the capital cost of making it happen. You buy the equipment and you put it up. It doesn't cost you hardly anything to keep running it. So when there's an auction held, the wind source and the solar source say, all right, we'll bid in at a penny because anything we get is good. The wind can do that, the hydro can do that. The hydro's all paid off in terms of the capital cost on the hydro. Nuclear, the, a lot of the capital is paid off and they're also in a situation where they kind of need to bid in even though they would lose money at two cents. Coal, because coal is using energy that they're pulling in from out of state and burning actively, they need to bid about what they what it costs them to do the energy. So that's a uniform clearing price. It, in the case where wind can give you so much energy but not as much as the grid needs, hydro can give you a little more but together it's not as much as the grid needs, add the nuclear and you're almost there but you need the coal, everybody gets the four cents, the coal bid. 
So everybody gets that four cents. So we are paying that whole purple area that is above the bid, okay? So yeah, as I said, renewables have an incentive to, to submit a very low bid. Now what happens oftentimes in New York State is there's something called peaking power. There's these plants which are up and running all the time and then you have natural gas plants that are called peaking plants. And it costs them a lot of money when they need to produce energy because it's sporadic for them and gas is more expensive than coal even at this point. So what happens when gas is in the mix and it comes in at eight cents a kilowatt hour, everybody gets eight cents a kilowatt hour. So we are paying a lot more money and this is what makes or allows the coal plants and the nuclear plants to be doing well at this point. Now what's going on and what has happened particularly in western New York is there's enough wind being generated at this point that we're cutting down the number of times that we go to this eight cents scenario. There are a lot of days when the wind is generating enough wind that we don't need to go to peaking power. And when that happens it's everybody gets four cents and the gas people are kind of up shit's creek. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was that was a feeble game. <laughs> so we are in Zone A at this point. Zone A is over in, in the west. Uh, Rochester Gas and Electric is kind of to our east. But all these counties in Zone A, in 2010, saved 31 million dollars because of wind supplanting natural gas. It's called the Merit Order Effect. There's a whole paper on the Wind Action Group about this, but it's really significant that this can happen. I, I hope folks understand it, and if you have questions later or, or whatever, please uh, follow up with me. I'll, I'll tell you where the paper is that explains the 31 mil million. Now, take it on a larger scale someplace like Germany. They spent in 2008 $4.5 billion more on their energy bills because they have the prices going into solar and going into wind and going into biogas. But the merit order effect saved them $5 billion in Germany. Now, you know, there are other external costs in terms of the environment, but just...